All right, you guys ready to jump in the Word? Okay, so I believe the Lord wants to speak some things to us. We are shifting gears in this next season of our messages. And, and because I feel like there is a direction the Lord wants our hearts to, to go. And he wants our focus to be right here. And I ha keep having this, this sense on the inside of seek the Lord while he may be found. And I feel like God is telling us as a congregation that it's time to turn our hearts to seek after him. And some of you may say, I've been seeking the Lord. And that's probably because you heard his call already. And this is something that you recognize. This is what God has for me to seek his face. There's so many things that people are going after. They're going after answers in so many different directions, right? People want security. They want confidence, they want safety, they want provision. So they are seeking answers. There are other people though, that are passively sitting there saying, I don't know what's going on. And so they're just gonna wait and see. But for us here at the gathering place, I believe God is, is inviting us to seek him. Now you might think that, well, we, we can always just seek the Lord. There's always an open invitation to seek God. And there is that, that there's always, there always is a call from God that we would draw near to him. But there are significant times and seasons when there is a, a door open from heaven that is not always open. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse six, it says, seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he is near. Let's read that out loud from the screen so we just get it in our minds and hearts. Seek the Lord while he may be found, call on him while he is near. So God is speaking this to us, the gathering place, to you and me, to us. And he's saying this Sunday morning, to us specifically, that the Lord may be found now. If you will seek him, he may be found now. Call upon him while he is near. When you read this and you think about it, what does it imply? There are seasons that people will seek after God and it's too late. Or it's not the right time. Or there are times when people would choose to call on him and he's not near. So that might sound opposite to our understanding and expectation of God. But when you read scripture, you'll see that concept show up at various times. You'll see that God says, hey, they started seeking me even with sacrifices, but they, they, won't, they haven't found me. They won't find me because they're seeking for the wrong reason or they're seeking in the wrong way. So there are times and seasons when God even invites believers who we're not just talking about getting into heaven, but just times and seasons when you can enter into the move of God, the plan of God, the, the specific, precise, perfect will of God in this moment for your life. And I believe that the Lord is saying to us as his followers to be sensitive to him saying this door is opening for you. Prepare your heart to seek me. Prepare your heart to seek after me. I'm gonna be found by you. I'm near. And we're in a period of near, the nearness of the Lord. And those of you who have served God for a long time, you know there are seasons, aren't there? There are seasons when, oh, it feels like God is so close and we're just seeing answers to prayer and, and, and the move of God. And then there's other seasons where it doesn't seem to be happening that way. And it's not because, well, I mean, it could be because something terrible you were doing or whatever, but it's not always that. There are just seasons when God is doing something significant that he is saying, now is when I'm ready to do it. Maybe it's because the people have been praying and prep, prep, preparing beforehand, but this, there are seasons. Is this right? Is this true? Would you say, you look back and you think there are times, yeah, I can sense that. I can, I can see those seasons. I got saved in one of those seasons in March of 1993. So that was 29 years ago, I gave my life to the Lord. Prior to that, I had gone to church with, with my friends. I didn't grow up going to church, but I went with friends. And, and oftentimes after partying and such, and Saturday nights and thinking about going to church with him on Sundays and even going to church, when the altar call would be given or the message that, you know, you sense the conviction in the heart of, oh, I, I, uh, I need to turn, you know, I need to respond. You ever feel that way? I hope so. <laughs> I hope you felt that way to where your heart's been, you know, beating a little bit harder at times and oh, I, I, God is drawing me in. But I remember this thinking, oh, but I'm not ready yet. I'm too young or, 
you know, my, my, my relationship status, I'm pretty satisfied with chasing after things over here and not really settling down and, and honoring God with my relationship lifestyle. And, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm not graduating. Maybe after I get out of high school, maybe after I get out, you know, go to college, maybe after I get a career, maybe after I get married, then I'll be able to settle down and, and uh, then I can serve the Lord. And so often we have these reasons for not seeking him now. And the problem with that is if you put it off and you think that that door is going to be open later on, you might find that it's not. Thank God that I had heat seeking grandma prayers, <laughs> finding me, chasing me down around the corner, slapping me in the back of the head saying, come back here, boy. You know, those kind of prayers. My friend's grandma, not even my own grandma, my friend's grandma, she was a prayer warrior and she went after me and, and, and God caught me. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 19, the story says this, now as he drew near, he saw the city of Jerusalem and he wept over it saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. But now they're hidden from your eyes for the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and they'll level you and your children within you to the ground. They will not leave in you one stone upon another. Why is that? Because you did not know the time of your visitation. So what he is saying to Jerusalem, this is before he's crucified and he, he is seeing, he is he's foretelling about the destruction of Jerusalem coming. But he says, you don't even realize that I am near. And if you would simply open your eyes and turn to me, the Prince of Peace here, if you could capture that, this is, this is the time when God has shown up in the flesh, in your midst, and you didn't even realize that it was your day of visitation. And so there's this idea that God is wanting to communicate to you and me that there are days and times and periods of the visitation of the Lord, not just for the big story of history and eternity that you see right here, but in our lives today, there are days of visitation. There are opportunities and invitations that come from him. And I believe that we are at that season now. And that's what I'm calling us to. That today is a day of visitation. That if we would respond to that and we would hear it and turn our hearts, then we will experience what he has for us. What they experienced, the disciples experienced a lot of it. But many people did respond, but, but the nation as a whole didn't. And they missed their opportunity, their window of opportunity. Imagine this. Imagine being around Jesus while he was on earth, but never really pressing in, surrendering, placing your faith, trust, following him, and then coming to believe afterwards. Thank God you believe afterwards, but would you look back and think, oh, I had an opportunity and I missed it. I missed that opportunity. I wish I could have sat at his feet and heard him more. I wish I could have, could have actually put my hand on his shoulder or maybe even had him lay his hands on me or I wish I could hear him speak the words or see his face and now I, I missed that. Thank God I'll see it in, in, in the future but, but I wish I had that. So there are these times of visitation that God sets up. We see this in the story of, uh, you know, it's funny how it's labeled and, and times change, language changes. The, uh, the parable of the, the ten virgins, the wise and foolish virgins. We don't really say that. We call them like the young single ladies now. <laughs> but we might not even say that because, you know, culture changes and our whole expectation of virgins and all this. Uh, but the word is what it is, and that's not really the point. I just think it's funny when you read the Bible. You relate to it like that's kind of funny. Hey, all you young virgins, come on over here. No, it's not that. Um, weird stuff. Okay, so. <laughs> but here's the story. Here's the story. So get, to the, get to the scripture, Pastor. Here's the story. This is, there's this wedding feast that's about to take place. Now, in the culture, this is how it would work. You would have the groom... Uh, getting prepared for the wedding banquet that's going to take place. And it's going to take place at his home. And so everybody starts gathering for days around the home. 
And then on the day, he gets his, his closest friends and maybe some, some family members, and the party's already going. Now, the, the weddings would typically play, take place in the Middle East here during the dry months, during the summer months, and it's oftentimes very hot, scorching hot in the day. And so you're not going to get together and do all this during the day. We wait till the evening when it starts to cool off. And so the, the groom, he's all excited. Everybody's partying. They're doing their, you know, their dances and all this. They're like, oh, this is so fun. And then he said, all right, come on, guys. I'm going to go get my bride. And so as he goes, he gathers his guys. And, and, and they, they leave and they go. Maybe it's across village town or maybe to even another village where the the bride is at and people you know kind of pour into the streets a little and and they wait and they're sitting there waiting for him to come back and then he gets there with his party and into the bride's house and he, he saddles her up on his donkey or whatever he's driving that day and and puts her on there and then he and the wedding party they start to form this kind of impromptu parade and they're going through the streets because they want to, he wants to show her to as many people like, this is my bride. And he's celebrating and he wants people to come out on the streets. And this is village life. Everybody knows everybody. They know everybody's business. And so this is a time to honor, celebrate. Maybe there's gifts that are being given. Maybe other people are joining the procession and they're going to come and follow. But he's going through the streets. And it seems like in this story, he's taking a long time. Because the Bible tells us this, that the kingdom of heaven is like these 10 virgins who were these ladies invited to the party, right? They took their lamps and they went out to meet the bridegroom. So this was the evening time. They're out there and they have their lamps, their little, their little flashlights with oil. It says, now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and they took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. Now it's starting to get late. We've been partying for a while and we've been celebrating. It's tired. We're sitting outside with our little lamps and, and they're not back yet. So I'm just going to take a nap. So they all took a nap. But at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and they trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise said, and answered saying, no, lest there should not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. Now that's, that's not like go to the store and find it. I mean, they could find oil. They could find it somewhere. Everybody knows everybody. You know, someone's going to have oil. So that's why it's not weird to say go buy some at midnight. Someone's going to help you out here. But we don't have enough for you and us. We only have enough for us. We prepared. We were the wise. We, we knew that there was a season and opportunity coming. And we prepared ourselves ahead of time for it. So that when it came, we would be ready. But those who were foolish did not. Now, it's interesting about the lamps anyways. In the Middle East, there you, you think, okay, with a lamp at night, there's no, especially this time, uh, there's no street lights, obviously. So you've got your candles or your lanterns and everyone would carry them and not necessarily uh, guys didn't have to carry the lamp they didn't have to carry that outside because you think about this this is both for your protection as a woman so that people would see who you are but it's also for your accountability in their culture no woman especially well no woman at all would be creeping around in the dark without a light so there's this idea of you keep your lantern on on so people can see you and they know what you're doing. It's just a culture that, that protects one another, but also really holds each other very accountable. And so guys could have the ability to not do this, but ladies didn't. So it's a big deal that you don't go out without your lamp. You don't do it. You just don't do it. And so they recognize this, that I can't be out here traveling without my lamp and I'm not going to be able to get in over there. I have to deal, I have to take care of this first. And and so we go back to the story here. They went out to buy and the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding and the door was shut. The door was shut. And afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, surely I do not know you. I don't know you. Jesus replies with this. He, he wraps it up. 
Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour which the Son of Man is coming. So we know this is talking about the return of Christ. We would understand that God is coming back. Jesus is coming back. And he says, watch, because you don't know when this is happening. You don't know the day or hour. It could be in your lifetime. It could be in your kid's lifetime. It could be at any time, he's saying. So our responsibility is to watch. And so we know this pertains to heaven. We know that we want to be prepared for the return of Christ. But there are also seasons when the door is open that we don't want to miss either. And there are times when that door shuts because we weren't prepared. And we miss out on what God has for us. So there's the celebration that's going on. And sometimes we could see this. We could be in the midst of a move of God, but not experiencing God moving. It could be as close as the person sitting next to us is hearing from God and, and seeing God show up in their life and all around us. But for some reason, I didn't respond. I sat passively by waiting to see what God would do. And, and if God wanted to do it, he'll do it. But there's no responsibility on me because, you know, God does what God wants to do and, you know, his ways are mysterious to us and you never know what he's going to do. And we kind of have that mindset so we don't actively set our hearts to pursue him. And there comes a day after the wedding, you know, the procession goes by and everybody's jumping in and excited that if we don't act now, we'll miss the opportunity. I don't know what God is telling us to prepare for, by the way, but I believe that God is wanting to show himself strong on our behalf. I believe that God is wanting to show up at the gathering place through the people of the gathering place, impacting our community in a significant way. I believe that we are going to see the hand of God at work and hear the testimonies of God moving in our midst. I believe that we're going to be talking about these kids who are giving their life to Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, praying for their teachers at school for healing, that families, just like Rich and Evelyn shared, we're going to have people coming back together and restoring families. I believe this is going to happen. I believe that you're going to see God promoting people and giving them opportunities to do things that they would have never been able to do on their own. I believe that we're going to see God uh, saving and radically transforming people right here in our midst, people getting delivered and set free. I believe we're going to see that. I believe that many of us are going to experience the, uh, the call and direction of God for their future, the, the calling, even if you're 60 years old plus, and thinking, okay, now God has just directed me to do this with my life. Yes, you have a life left that God wants to be in charge of. For others, they're, they're, uh, it could be as simple as a transformation of the heart and mind. I don't know exactly what it is he's going to do. I know God's in the business of doing all those things, and he wants to do it in our, in our midst. But he's telling us to seek him while he may be found. Seek him, call upon him while he is near. The limited time invitation the limited time invitation is to enter into the fullness of what God is doing here and now. I'm not saying, and if you miss this, you're not going to heaven. I am not saying that if you miss this, he'll never do anything else in your life again, or that for somehow you will just be, you know, less than. I'm not saying, I don't believe he's saying, I think it's sort of like with the disciples. Many are called, few are chosen. Jesus said this. You know, there were other people that he called to himself and invited to the table who said, I'm busy. I'm distracted right now. I've got other things going on. First, let me go take care of my family business over here. First, let me uh, go and talk to so-and-so over here. You know, there's these examples he gives in the scripture where people could have been like one of, one of the, the 12 and they, they didn't show up. And then maybe one of the 70, he, he has different levels of, of, of invitation he's given. And he's called far more people than responded. And, and I want to be, I want to be like, I want to be like one of the 12 who, who are there with him. But not just one of the 12, you know, the 12 disciples in the Bible, there were three that were even closer to him. Peter, James, and John. They were like his inner circle. I want to be like that, but I don't just want to be like Peter. Peter, James, and John. I want to be like John who was able to rest his head on Jesus' bosom 
right? Like it's a weird, weird word. If anyone wants to rest their head on your bosom, you might want to ask questions first. Um, but there is this this picture that we see of John just leaning in, and there's this closeness with Jesus that he has, and intimacy with him. And how do you get there? How do you get there? You've got to set your heart to go after him. The invitation is there, but it's not a requirement. Meaning this, you can, you can come to Christ and experience salvation and see God do some things that are really significant, make it to heaven, praise the Lord, like I love you, he loves me. But there's so much more here. There's so much more now. And I think that we have to be sensitive to these moments when the invitation comes. I, I want to close with, with this here. A scripture and a conversation. In the gathering place, one of the things we like to do is not just sit shoulder to shoulder, facing forward. I preach, you listen, you eat, go home. Uh, I like, I, I feel like for our, us as a church, we have to engage face to face. Centuries, it seems like. The church, they met in, in homes. They, they met uh, in places where they could get face to face and they would pray with one another, know what's going on in each other's life, stand together, support one another, encourage, protect one another, serve one another. And then somewhere along the lines, we got this idea that, man, we could fit a whole lot more people in the same room if we just do rows and we all face forward. And boy, can we be more effective because I could preach one message and everyone can hear it and surely they're all going to be transformed by it. The problem is... We don't own it until we talk about it, until we engage around it, until we think, what, what, the, what is this saying to me? And we, and we can share that with others, they share it with us, you can have the connection and conversation. And so my heart is that church would not just be facing forward, but we'd be facing one another. We'd have that kind of posture and community here to where, uh, not that I just know what's going on in your life, but I, I know what's going on and I'm with you in this. I care about this, and I want to see you succeed. I want to see you strong. I want to see you whole. I want to see your, your family change, and I'm praying with you, and I know this. And I want you to be able to speak into my life because there are some things that, that I, I need to work on here, and, and would you come alongside me? Like that kind of thing in church. I don't know if, you, if that's what you're here for, but that's where we're going. Um, and, and if you are not ready for that, just stick around. Because I believe that you have something that God wants to pour into you or pour out of you into others. But there's something he has for you as well. But this last scripture, Hosea 10, verse 12, says, Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. There's two things that, that really stand out to me about this verse. When I'm reading it, sow for yourselves righteousness. So sow to yourself. You, when it comes to seeking the Lord, he's saying there are things that you have to invest in yourself. There are things that you have to do for yourself here. That you have to plant certain seeds so that later you will reap the harvest of those things, right? And so sow for yourselves righteousness. Uh, the second thing is break up your follow ground. Follow ground... Follow ground is uncultivated ground. It's unused ground. So if you're a farmer, maybe you have several fields. And in order to not strip that field of its nutrients by planting, 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 you have, you've planted before, but you let it lay fallow, meaning I'm not, it's, it's, it might have been broken up at some point and used, but for a while it's uncultivated. I have not tended to that for a while. It's been, I've been very passive regarding this area of my life. And what happens with follow ground, it's useful. There's, it becomes like a, uh, over time, it be, it, the nutrients are replenished to it. And there's all kinds of opportunity. There's all kinds of potential in that field. And God is saying, uh, with your follow ground in your life, there's all kinds of potential and opportunity. But you have to tend to it. Because what happens over time, if you don't, it gets hard. The ground is hardened, and he's saying, break it up. You have to get in there and do some work in your life here in order to prepare that to be fruitful. And all of this has to do with seeking the Lord. 
And so there's two questions that I want to give us an opportunity to maybe turn to one or two people and, and just think about this for a minute here and, and talk about it. But first question is this, what are the courageous steps in the right direction that you need to take? And seeking the Lord, he says, sow for yourself righteousness. So maybe there are some things on the inside you thinking, oh, the right step for me that's going to take some courage that's not so easy maybe or it, uh, it's going to take some strength or some um, very intention, uh, intentionality and energy. I'm going to have to put some effort into this, some courageous steps in the right direction. Maybe there are some changes in your schedule. Maybe there are changes in your friend circle. Maybe there are changes in what's coming into your ears and before your eyes. Maybe there are some, some changes along that way, that, those lines. So what are some courageous steps in the right direction that you need to take? And then breaking up the follow ground, that passive area of your life. What's an uncultivated area of your life that you want to develop? Maybe there's something that you're sensing as you hear this and you think, yeah, man, I, I, I want to start to really develop in my, my prayer life or my time of worship or my, my time uh, in the word or maybe in some accountable relationships or life-giving relationships. I need some other believers alongside of me and I need to develop this. Maybe the uncultivated ground, there, there could be some who said, man, I've been out of church for so long that just getting back into the rhythm of that that's uncultivated. It used to be a part of my life, but, but maybe that right there has kind of been pushed to the side because I'm distracted in this field over here. And maybe that's an area or an aspect. There could be some other opportunities that, that it's not um, because of neglect, but it's just now is the time that you sense God's telling you to go after this, or I would like to do that. So this is what I want to do. Let's take a moment and maybe just with the person next to you, or you can get in your ta at your tables, you might want to get up if you're all by yourself or you're thinking there's a really good looking person I'd like to meet over there or whatever it is. I mean, if you're going to meet your spouse, do it at church. Um, uh, however you want to do it. I'm not going to judge unless we have to. Um, but let's take a, a, a couple minutes here just to answer those two questions. Let's do that. And then, and then I'll bring us right back together. So don't leave. Ready? Here you go. Are you still talking about what we started talking about? Did we did we get some answers? Kind of shot out some one or two word answers. What do you what are some courageous steps? Any any areas of courageous steps to take or yeah, let's just do courageous steps. Not being afraid to speak out is a courageous step in and, and preparing to seek the Lord. I've got to be able to be a little bit more bold. What else? Any courageous steps in the right direction? Coming to a new church. Is it this one? <laughs> I'm like, good. Yeah, I'm going to find a new church. Yeah, after this Sunday. Can't wait. Glad you're here. What about uncultivated areas? Anyone feel like, man, this area I've got to, I've got to start to break up the ground and, and, and start to develop. Evangelism. Evangelism. That could easily sit by the wayside for a while, right? Let's get, let's get going on it. That's a courageous step too. What else? Only one thing. Um, what, what other areas of your life do you feel like you need to cultivate? Spending time reading the word and understanding. So good. Yeah. I know you guys want to jump back into conversation. We're going to have some food with it. Let me just say this. There, when I ask these questions for us to talk about, I try to make it to where it's anyone can enter into the conversation and you don't feel like you have to re uh, reveal too much of the depth of your heart. Like, oh, I don't want to be put on the spot like that. And, and you don't ever have to be. But I do want you to also take time before between the Lord. And maybe if there is somebody that you're connecting with and, and actually think about this a little bit deeper. Are there some things that I'm sowing into my life that are sowing unrighteousness? Because he's saying you, you start to stop that and start sowing the, the right things in there. 
And then even the uncultivated areas, man, what are some of the things that I know God's told me to work on and I haven't been working on? So process those things before the Lord as well. He's the one that's going to help you do it. And so none of it is, is him saying, yeah, you sucker. No, it's him like, oh, no, let's get this together because I want to rain righteousness down on you. I really do want to do something. So now is the time to seek the Lord. Let's all stand to our feet, can we? And we're going we're gonna to close in prayer. Uh, I want you to be able to continue with your conversation, and then we're going we, to break bread, have fun, food. I want to say this to you. For, for those of you who don't have a home church, give us a year. I believe the word of God will change your life. And so we would love to have you if you are looking for a home church. Pray about it and see if the Lord is calling you here. Uh, we have open arms for you. Uh, we are going after the Lord. And over the next several weeks, we're talking about seeking the Lord. And that's just where we're at leading up to Easter. We believe many people are going to come. Just as you talked about evangelism, we're going to reach out, invite people. And we really want to introduce them to Jesus. We are wanting to seek the Lord so that he may be found, right? And also others would find him. And so maybe that's a big part of why he's saying, prepare your heart to seek after me. Because there are others that, that need to hear me, see me, know me, experience me uh, through this community. So uh, if you need prayer for anything in particular, I would love for you to connect with those same people you're praying with if you like, or I'm praying with you as well. But Lord, we bless you. We thank you, Lord God, that you have invited us to seek after your face, Lord, because you want to be found. You play hide and seek because you want to be found. And so, Lord, we turn our hearts to you right now, every single person. God it is invited, so we turn our hearts to you right now. We place our faith and trust in you. Guide us and direct us on how to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.